Thank you very much. Um, let me continue on energy and climate issues, which we discussed uh, in a panel that was uh, moderated by uh, Valérie Ducrot from the uh, Global Gas Centre, who is here in the room and uh, who, who may, of course, then be available as well for, for further comments. I think the, we, we first uh, enjoyed a very sobering, uh, factual uh, presentation on the fact that geopolitics are back big time affecting energy markets and policies and and yet with a disconnect because that needs to be fully incorporated actually into policies especially uh, in uh, net importing countries in Europe and and is not yet the case and and so geopolitics matter in, especially in oil and gas as you may imagine but also increasingly in industrial value chains and they matter because there is an uneven, uh, an uneven uh, split of resources and reserves globally, of course, of oil and gas. But if we mention oil, we have about almost three of the world's largest or some of the largest resource holding countries under sanctions. And, and, and that is, of course, uh, an unprecedented situation with uh, Russia, Iran and, and Venezuela, although Venezuela there are some latest developments uh, to be followed, but but the point is, this leads to volatility. This should trigger uh, policies that uh, you know can 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 ensure resilience, and um, and this uh, also points to a mismatch between the falling investments, for example, in the upstream oil and gas that we've seen, and the fact that demand instead of falling and, and following that trend has actually been continuing to increase. So there is an obvious problem here and we are going to face this problem uh, for, for, for the next years. And so do not expect any fall in prices and actually expect quite the contrary or at least a lot of more volatility. And, um, and so there is an obvious investment challenge on the fossil fuel side, but of course there is a major investment challenge on the renewable side. And, and we noted, of course, that uh, the uh, investment allocated to renewables is uh, increasing year by year and, and is making spectacular progress. But uh, let's not uh, be uh, complacent. This is still way below what is needed to put us on track for a 1.5 degrees trajectory. We then, I think, had a very interesting uh, conversation on global governance, uh, global energy governance and global energy and climate governance, actually, um, which uh, highlighted, indeed, some of the uh, tensions that are out there between the so-called global north and global south. Indeed, there is a uh, there is elements uh, of uh, double standards that have been identified. We have um, also uh, discussed some imbalances created by Russia's war in Ukraine and some of the fundamental systemic imbalances in markets, namely, for example, that uh, uh, a large part of the spot LNG market has been siphoned off by the Europeans at the expense of uh, several emerging economies, which uh, I should stress, uh, is in no way violating any contractual obligations, but it's just uh, uh, translating a reality where even in a world governed by contracts, you still have the market aspect uh, that translates into, well, the ones that's ready to pay the most gets it at, at the end, right? And gets the cargoes and the volumes at the end. So obviously, uh, this, was, uh, this was part of the discussion. Another point that was raised was the issue of how do we democratize uh, global energy and climate governments. The Wizards' views expressed that uh, this governance is imbalanced towards the north and that, you know, some of the leading institutions are based in the north, uh, uh, you know, uh, driven by the OECD notably or the IEA. Um, and and that obviously that there's a need for a rebalance there. And, and, and actually we agreed, uh, or at least it was a consensus to say that, well, that needs to be somehow democratized and, and that we need more dialogue among all the, all the stakeholders. And there was a, an idea to set up a, uh, an, an energy security council 
which was uh, raised, which is quite interesting. Um, although if you start thinking in practical terms, um, you immediately, of course, uh, come up with a number of uh, questions and issues. But, but still, I think, uh, you know, with rising India and, and, and rising Indonesia, etc., this, uh, this definitely deserves to be, uh, to be looked at uh, in future. Um, nonetheless, of course, it was pointed out that we still have or already have, I should say, uh, global uh, institutions such as, uh, or, or, or forums such as, of course, COP, and uh, which actually brings together the North and the South. And, um, and, and of course, so we are not here in the desert, right? Uh, totally. So there's still, a, um, there's already uh, something in place, but uh, work can be further done on, on, on complementing that. Um, then we, we moved on to discuss, uh, of course, the, the many environmental and climate urgencies. And, and needless to say, there was a reminder that we are in a race against time. We are in a race against ourselves, uh, that we are not on track. But some interesting perspectives for, for all of you who may not all be energy and climate experts, but it was reminded that it's not just about CO2. It's not actually about only greenhouse gas emissions altogether, but it's equally uh, about greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity, and that the one cannot deliver without the other. So these are the, the two hands um, which we are to work on. It was reminded that we just have COP15 in, in Montreal, which of course attracts much less attention, regrettably, than a COP27 or, or the forthcoming COP28. Another important element uh, brought into the discussion was that we should not overfocus on supply side issues and supply side solutions. And of course, there will be a lot of new technologies coming and we've seen incredible progress there over the past years, but we should really focus much more on demand side solutions and technologies as well, especially in electricity systems. And there was a point made that, well, electricity systems will be increasingly decentralized. And of course, not everywhere. And that has different meanings, where, depending on where you are. But, you know, also the thinking of, you know, everything being central and, and the way electricity systems were established in past years or in past, I should say, past uh, 50 or 60 years, obviously we'll see changes there. So one has to think about, you know, flexibility on the supply and demand side. Um, one also... Uh, you know, uh, the transformation is about electrifying systems, but saying that should not, you know, set aside that a lot of the focus should be on producing heat. And uh, and so you can produce heat for various forms. Nuclear was mentioned as a, as a fundamental solution for that. And then <clears throat> we mentioned two of the issues that popped up in Europe recently, but still have to make their way across the world, which is... Uh, energy sobriety, so that's obviously something uh, for uh, developed economies. I mean, if you have uh, nothing or almost nothing, uh, it's, it's ridiculous to speak about it. But nonetheless, we see a lot of uh, emerging economies that, uh, that uh, have also room to, to improve that. A focus on circularity, reuse, reinject, um, a major stumbling block, which is still to be addressed, which is how do you store electricity in the longer term? And, and that is something for, for everyone to, 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 to focus on, and especially a, a, a new avenue uh, for, for R&D efforts. And then, and then of course, uh, it was reminded that we still have a lot of work to fix uh, the inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, as is the wording in official uh, governance declarations. And that obviously here, uh, we still have a lot of work to do, both in the north and the south, and that, of course, the directions taken uh, with the crisis uh, is not uh, is not really, um, of course, uh, uh, wished for. What are uh, a last uh, point, um, and I'll end here um, regarding the different uh, countries and geographies. I think we we also touched up in Russia, and uh, and it was there was an interesting perspective. I think for, for everyone to, to have in mind, thinking about uh, the future after the war, which is that maybe there is a possibility that indeed uh, a new post-war Russia 
uh, might be uh, actually might rise uh, based on uh, a, a, a commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to decarbonize the, the Russian economy. And and it was uh, mentioned that you know the younger part of the youngest generation in Russia is extremely interested in these topics. So I think that's uh, you know some hope at the end of uh, and some light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to pass the floor to my colleague.